So welcome, uh, Chris, Catherine, Hannah, Simon, Emma. Welcome to the Natural Resources Management Showcase. It's our first showcase of our March break virtual open house. Um, just some housekeeping uh, matters before we actually start. Um, my name's Alex. I work in the undergraduate recruitment office. I'm going to basically turn it over to my colleagues who will host the showcase. Uh, they'll introduce themselves. Uh, that is not Jennifer Bain Mannion uh, that you see in one of the uh, squares. Um, that is the, the Dean, Ulf, but he'll introduce himself. Um, uh, just know that we are be, we are recording this, so if you ever want a refresher of some of the topics that were covered, you will have access to the recording, which includes a PowerPoint um, after the fact. Uh, just know that we are all working from home, so there could be interruptions. I don't know if the two gentlemen have any pets. I don't, but I do have a landline that occasionally rings. Uh, I've turned my cell phone off, but um, it could be anything from uh, a delivery to you know a clock going off, so thanks for your patience in advance. Um, we do have a question and answer uh, function at the bottom. Everyone should see a Q and A where you can type your questions. I'll be behind the scenes answering them. <laughs> if there's anything I can't answer, if it's very specific to the faculty, I will hold those questions and then uh, Matt will occasionally take some breaks and I'll pose the questions. Um, there's also a chat function on the side. Uh, I will just type hello so that you all see that. Um, can I actually get all of you to type a yes or no that you can hear me okay? Just to test it out. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Simon. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Emma. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you, Savannah. So that, that wasn't just an exercise uh, to show me that you can all hear me. It's also an exercise to show you that if you choose the Faculty of Natural Resources Management, you're very much going to be a Savannah, a Hannah, an Emma, a Catherine, a Simon, et cetera. These professors that you see before you will know you on a first name basis. And from the day you, you start with them till the day they give you your degree up on stage, you're going to be a person with a name to them. So without further ado, I'm going to mute myself, go off camera, and I'll let uh, Matt Leach take over. Thanks, Alex. Okay, well, um, I guess we'll start first by, uh, I'll let Alf introduce himself, and then I'll introduce myself, and then we'll get going from there. So Alf, uh, you want to jump in here? Yeah, my name is uh, Alf Runnison, not Jennifer. Jennifer is our admin that uh, if you choose to come, you'll see her a lot. Um, my name is Olf, as I said, I'm a registered professional forester. Uh, my specialization is uh, remote sensing and international. Uh, with remote sensing, that means uh, they use the satellites, airborne, and uh, in the last decade or so, a lot of use of drones. Uh, I'm the dean of the program for the last uh, 12 years or so, and uh, I um, very much enjoy being a forester. I very much enjoy being part of this faculty and dealing directly with students. Matt. Thanks all. Okay, and I'm uh, Dr. Matt Leach. I am the chair of the Honors Bachelor of Science in Forestry program. And my specialization is in uh, wood science, forest products and marketing. Um, so between Alf and I, we commonly do a lot of these promotional things. And like Alf, I'm a forester. All my degrees are in forestry and I too, um love what we do in our jobs and love nothing more than going out for a walk in the woods i live in the country and have a big wood lot that i manage so uh, we talk to talk and walk the walk as well so um what we've got planned today we've got a powerpoint that i'm going to show you it just sort of outlines a little bit about forestry and that in the province um what we do at the faculty the, the programming that we offer the courses um, field schools that we offer that is quite unique to our program, both in Ontario and in Canada, I believe, uh, and how you can get in touch with us, what potential jobs are and stuff like that. Um, at any point in the, in the PowerPoint, 
if you have any questions, just speak out, um, turn your mics on so I can hear you. And we're happy to ha answer questions at any point during the PowerPoint. Before we start, I'd like to tell you what I spent my morning doing. Um, I spent my morning doing career advice to students that have left our program and are doing fantastic. And uh, we do a lot of follow up with past students. And uh, just remember that if you come to our group, you'll be part of something that will probably last you your entire career. And uh, I think that's unique to on how we function and students do keep in touch with, with us. Uh, Matt gets this all the time too. And uh, uh, again, you're not here simply to get over a four year degree or five years for some of you, but you're here to, to build something for your future. And we're very proud of, of, of our past students. So uh, Matt, take over. And Alex just told me that um, you guys are muted, so you can't talk right now. So if you have questions, put them in the chat. Alex will collect them. And if, if I see any, I'll answer them as we go too. But Okay, so um, I'm going to share our screen. And I guess before we get started, the one thing that we should mention about our faculty, because it's not really covered in this PowerPoint, is we are a fairly small faculty at Lakehead campus. We have about 14 professors. Um, we have very small class sizes, which is an advantage for everybody. And first year classes could be could be up as high as 50. After that, they quite quickly drop down to typically below 30. And some of my advanced courses that I ran could be under five. Um, and like all says this morning, I spent in a lecture, my wood science lectures. And uh, so, and we pride ourselves on an open door policy where students can come see us anytime they want. If we're in our office, you can come speak to us. Um, if we're not there, obviously we, we can't, but otherwise, you don't have to make appointments to come see us. Um, and we know our students. Like I say, students call me Matt, Matthew. Nobody calls me doctor or professor. We know our students by their first name. It's a very sort of laid back atmosphere as far as that's concerned. So we, we like it that way. There's no intimidation between faculty and, and students, um, which I find is very comfortable. The students quite appreciate that. Okay, so I'm gonna share my screen now. We have a, a PowerPoint here. So I'm just going to go through this. And like I say, if you have some questions, you can put them in the chat and then we'll either answer them as we go. But every five or 10 minutes, I'll stop so that uh, um, if anyone has any questions, they can type them up. So as you say, we are the Faculty of Natural Resources Management. And uh, as you say, we are located in Thunder Bay for this particular program. And we are have been, Natural Resources Management is our name now. We were the School of Forestry originally. This used to be a polytech school way back in the 50s and 60s. And then the Faculty of uh, School of Forestry, Faculty of Forestry, Faculty of Forestry and Environment. And the degree has evolved, so we, we've changed our name accordingly. And now we are a professional degree, but we natural resources management because truly that's what we, what's, what we do. We're not just about trees, although that's a big component. We, um, we're about everything to do with the natural landscapes, okay? And as we mentioned here, we do have two degrees and we have ni nice little pictures. All these pictures are our students. They're not stuff we grab off the web. These are our students out in the field. Um, this fellow here out in wetlands running some uh, analytical. This on the left here is um, one of our grad students with undergrads using underwater drones, which is part of Alf's operation. He also has you know octocopters, quadcopters, fixed wing planes, pretty much everything that you can imagine when it comes to drones. Um, so, and that's, you'll see that as we go through this presentation. One of the big things about our faculty is we pride ourselves on keeping on top of stuff. We're very much into our tech and we have state-of-the-art technology that we utilize. Okay, so everything is up to date, nothing old. Students get to use stuff that you will use when you graduate, which is very good for them, okay? And as it says here, our students, these are some older pictures, as you can tell. Alf was one of these, was a student in our program in the 70s. Um, I started here in the early 2000s, but I did my undergrad uh, at another school way back when. But we've been running since officially, I think since about, uh, well, the Polytech School was here in the 50s, and I think 65, 70 was our first graduating class. Um, so we're quite, quite proud of our, our history here. So, so we obviously, we honor the past, um, but we prepare for today and tomorrow. 
Okay, so we look back on how we've done things and we're always looking forward to how we can do things better. We're an industry that are continually improving on how we do our business. We don't just sit back and it works, so we'll stop. We continually move. So we went from, as you can see here, picture with old crosscut saws 100 years ago to chainsaws to mechanized harvesting equipment to full machinery. Um, it's an ever-changing industry. One commonality, and this picture probably doesn't, isn't uh, set up that way, is our students, you know, we dress a bit rough because we're in the field. Plaid is, seems to be the, uh, uh, the standard color pattern for forestry students, <laughs> good or bad. Uh, we like plaid and it's warm, so that's always a good thing. So. I mean, you can see the students here. We always have a, a group picture at the end of each year. They're, the students become very good friends because of the size of our program. Um, and these are lifelong friends that we make. I'm still close with almost all the students that I went through university with in the 80s. And we still keep in touch. Okay, so forestry in Canada, um, you know, this is a great industry and great profession to get into. Um, it's been a backbone industry for this country for well over 100 years now. And we are considered some of the best forest managers on the planet. We have the most sustainable forests. We have the most certified forests. And we do very good work. People look to us on how we do our business. So um, we're quite proud of, of the history of this industry. And very quickly, we realized back in the day that management is important. Okay, so in Ontario, in the 60s to the 80s, we had crown management units. Um, the MNR, Ministry of Natural Resources, was a major employer of our students, which you'll see has changed over time. Industry was growing and continue to grow and evolve. We, uh, from the early days, has been a, um, a commodity-based industry where we had produced a lot of paper, pulp and paper, and lumber. We've expanded that now into all sorts of value-added and multitudes of uh, products that come from the forest, not just direct forestry, but non-forest timber products as well, such as you know, wildlife and um, foods and other things that we can get from the forest. Okay, big government and company budgets for forestry, growing public interest in what has been done and what's being done in the forest. Okay. Crown Timber Act brought in was multiple use, so it started to incorporate. In my undergrad, we started to look at management plans where we're incorporating not just timber, but wildlife, um, social values, which is even becoming more and more important in, the, in our management. So then they were more or less fairly simple management plans. We, we cut wood and we make sure that we were doing it sustainably so that when we regrow it, we're always going to have a good supply feeding the mills and the industries. Not a lot of consultation with the general public, um, as was the case with a lot of natural resources, mining, you know, forestry, fishery, everything. Um, we were the professionals and we were left to do what we do. The public has a lot more input now, and that's, that's not a bad thing. It, it keeps everybody honest. And then who did it then? MNR played a major role in management. MNR in charge of roads, nurseries, and rural, some tendered sales. And that's changed quite a bit um, more recently. Eight, nine, it was kind of a, a time and the industry was going good. And then back in those days, about every 10 years, some of the industries would cycle and they'd go on a little bit of downturns. Um, it's a little bit different than that now because of global marketing. But industry to be funded for operations, late 80s saw lack of M&R funding for forest management agreement commitments. Um, and there was more concerns as far as the stakeholders, meaning the general public. Um, so then we started getting more sophisticated in our planning, but still timber was the underlying point of why we did our business. But there was more sustainable design, development, environmental assessments of forest management. Um, so now all plans now go through a, an environmental assessment and are looked at for how they impact everything on the landscape. Okay, so forest management agreements were signed. Still mostly crane management units. M and R still in charge of most of these um, parts of the industry. 90s to 2000s, we're starting to get a lot more change and a lot more complicated. Our ability to write plans and with computers has improved significantly. Um, for most of you, you will have never known an age when computers didn't exist or when phones used to be hardwired to a wall and stuff like that. Um, for Alf and I's younger days, computers were not even, my first year at university, computers didn't even exist. It was my third year in the mid 80s um, that they started getting 
you know, very low power by today's standards computers. And so modeling forestry was not exactly easily, easily done because of computing power was very minimal. Um, I remember in our fourth year when we finally had a 386 computer um, that was state of the art at the time, it only took about eight to 10 hours to run one of our management plans in it. So if we were lucky, we could run two and a bit plans in a given day if we timed it right. Nowadays, you put, push the button and almost immediately an answer comes up, but we're fortunate now to have very powerful systems. Um, I think it makes more work in some respects too, though. Okay, so in the 890s, the MNR is starting to shrink and the industry is starting to take more responsibility for planting and roads and stuff like that. Okay, growth for industry, and then we start to see new products or antique strand or things like that coming online. Okay, and then this is where the industry started evolving a bit. We started producing new products besides our commodities. Okay, timber uh, environmental assessment decision, terms and conditions, Crown Forest Sustainability Act. So now we have an act for how we manage um, new forest planning manuals, sustainable forest management instead of timber management. So it includes everything in the forest and then uh, protected areas. So the FM, FMAs became sustainable forest licenses, Crown management units converted to the sustainable forest uh, licenses. Trust for renewal fund, meaning for planting and stuff, like the Forestry Futures Trust. Um, and forest be became a licensed profession, our registered professional foresters. So when you graduate from our forestry program, you are, after working for a couple of years and sponsored by your boss, you become a registered professional forester, meaning your signature becomes a legal document. Um, so it's much like the professional engineers or the PNGs where any management plan, any work from consultants that is government-based and anything else requires an RPF signature on it and stamp, okay? So you become a professional, um, just like in other professional fields like engineering. And that's a big thing for, for foresters because to do a management, you have to be an RPF. And our program, of course, is accredited. Our forestry program is fully accredited, so you are entitled to become an RPF. The EM program is slightly different but there are courses you can take in addition to the program, a few more courses that can allow you to get your RPF status. And we are working to get um, that program accredited as well. Okay, so from 2000 onwards, the industry changed drastically and it continues to. We're in a global market now. And so we have competition from all over the planet. Before countries used to be fairly protectionist in that they, they took care of their own industries and then we exported. Now it's an it's a open market on the world. And so we're competing with everybody. And in our industry, forestry um, and natural resources, the biggest competition is not our neighbors to the south, there are neighbors in Europe and in other parts of the Northern hemisphere. Part of our biggest competition is now coming from the Southern hemisphere where they are able to grow forests 12 months of the year and very quickly and a fraction of the time we do. So that's, that's the big, one of the biggest transformations of this industry has been the globalization and the opening of markets such that everybody gets to compete now. So once, if you are very strong in something, now you've got more competition. In some respects, it's good because it, it creates, uh, that competition creates uh, better pricing for people when there's competition. Um, but it's also made it means that people have to really tighten their belts as far as maintaining their standing in the marketplace. So we have that, we have ENGOs, certifications, FMP manuals, forest management plan manuals, um, increased demands from Aboriginal interests, management planning more complex because we now have to include not just trees, but you have to include everything, the wildlife, the little critters on the ground crawling around, the birds, the animals, the waterways, you know, so all of this social interests. So we not only have you know, the management for economics, but we also have societal needs, which isn't all about cutting trees down. People like to walk in the woods or hunt or do whatever. So all this has to be included in our uh, management plans, including things like species at risk. So there's special conditions for species at risk. And those are in the guides for our planning. Um, we had to look at industry job losses as competition or globalization occurred. Of course, everyone had to become more competitive, which means automation of systems to remain competitive, which meant job losses. So we had to find other ways to employ people. And we've been pretty good at this in increasing our markets from just commodity to value adding, which brings in a lots of work. 
Um, so that's, that's good. And then we look at things like wood flow. So optimization and logistics. That's a huge part of what we do now. Um, making plastics from wood. So this is again, transforming the industry from used to be just strictly wood and commodity to wood plastic composites, wood for energy, wood for um, clothing. So textiles, so you can make that from, you know, dissolving pulp mills, all these sorts of things using nanocellulose technology. They're now making bulletproof vests out of essentially wood because they're using the, the finest chemical components, cellulose at the nano level, the little wee nanotubes have greater strength than carbon fiber. And so they're using them for that exact thing, for strength and bodies for cars, armor for uh, military, all sorts of stuff. So the industry is really, it's been going like this and now it's about to do this. We have, there's more markets that are gonna come available to us um, than I think we even realize now. And one of the big things we do is that in this industry, we're saying even from a, a chemical point of view, trees are literally chemical factories. We're now, the belief is that everything we make from petroleum-based chemicals we can make from wood chemicals so we can replace a lot of the fossil fuels and their chemicals with trees so that it is a really bright future in this area whether you want to be a forester an environmental a chemist that deals with wood there's just a multitude of areas you can move into okay and then what does protection mean because that's a big thing can we protect our forest well leaving them alone and doing nothing is not a means of protection a means of protection is sustainably managing them. And that could be not doing anything, but making sure they're healthy. But also a well-managed forest is a very healthy forest. And then in today's age where, you know, atmospheric carbon is at an all time high. I mean, the last time we hit the level like this over 400, we went into a, a, a mini ice age. So hopefully the planet's not about to reset again, but trees sequester incredible amounts of carbon. So planting trees, is a very inexpensive solution to the problem the planet's in. So forestry is a solution that can help fix the mess we're in right now. And that saying where they said, if we plant tree, three trillion trees globally, that will basically address the high carbon in the atmosphere and start to get us back where we should be. You know, that was not just somebody making that up. That was, that was a, a research that calculated this and, you know, it's not that difficult. If everybody planted trees, we'd be in a much better position. <laughs> trees are an answer. Okay. And then we have students for, so we have people who have prepared students for forest stewardship beyond Ontario for Kyoto, invasive insects, green energy, nuclear international, so on. There's all sorts of things we can do in this industry using the technologies that, you know, people don't think that foresters can do. Okay, so how have we advanced um, in the faculty, advanced the tree and academic priorities of our university. We achieve excellent in teaching, learning, and research. We're very active in our teaching. We love what we do. Our learning outcomes are very good, and we're very much at the hands-on experiential learning, which is students appreciate, and it's a very good way to teach. And we're very research heavy. We have a lot of good researchers in our faculty doing state-of-the-art research. And we do that most regionally, but not also nationally and internationally, which gives a lot of opportunities for a student. Extended community engagement and outreach. We work a lot with communities, both in our field schools when we take these students and for research projects in the undergrad and graduate level and as a faculty. Encourage and support diversity. We have quite a diverse group of faculty members alone, let alone the students in our group. We have them from East India, from China, from European countries, from the States, from South America. Um, we have students from all over the place. Faculty members, we have Canadians, we have Chinese faculty, East Indian, Alf is Swedish, we have Finnish. Um, we literally have people from all over the world. Commitment to Aboriginal students. Um, we're obviously in the North here, and we, as research, we do a lot with uh, First Nations. Um, it's brought into our programs. It's, it's an ascent, it's a core part of all programs at Lakehead is an Aboriginal component. Um, so we have that brings that into it. And that's also a part of management. So it has to be included. And then our international uh, reach. Um, people like all and myself, we do work in Ghana and continue to do work. I do work in South Africa. Um, we do work in South America. We do work all over North America and in European and Nordic countries. 
So we're very big on international work. And as you'll see, that's part of our field school as well. So we're comprehensive, sustainable that we teach, um, research growth and diversity. Those are sort of some of the pillars of how we teach. And just to show the importance of what we do, um, Alf and I have been doing, or Alf's been doing research in Ghana for over 20 years now. We're starting that up again, and I've been there a few times. And we've got five memorandums of understandings working. And this is just an example of the type of stuff we do overseas. And we involve our students with this. Our students have been to Ghana on an international field school. And we plan when we can travel again to bring um, students there again, now that we have new collaborations set up. And so that's about eight to 10 days traveling around that country. But this is just a quick video. So hopefully this works of um, when we were in Ghana and the last MOUs we signed in the media outlet from it. Ghana's Lake Head University of Ontario, Canada, is reaching out to a number of Ghanaian institutions that specialize in environmental studies and forestry management. The institutions are the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research, CSIR, the Forestry Commission, and the University of Cape Coast. They will collaborate on research, training, and innovative science to secure the forest estate of the country. Napoleon Atikito has this report. At the round table discussion to deepen collaboration among partners and sign a memorandum of understanding to seal it, were representatives of Lakehead University of Canada, the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research, CSIR, the Forestry Commission, and the University of Cape Coast. These institutions will be key actors in the partnership. The Director General of CSIR, Professor Victor Ajimai, and his deputy, Professor Paul Busu, called the alliance a Philip and a boon to science innovation. This is a very important occasion for us, not only as scientists, but also as practitioners of science. As practitioners, we we'll, we'll have the mandate to convert the natural resources of this country, the natural resources, of, of course, uh, of Canada, for the productive use of our peoples. When we heard that uh, there was this institutional uh, partnership in other, for research, innovation, science and development, we were very uh, pleased uh, with that because as far as we're concerned and even the government is concerned, it is research, science and technology that drives the economy. The director of CSIR Forestry Research Institute of Ghana Forig, based in Kumasi, Professor Dr. Daniel Ofori, laid bare some contemporary issues affecting forest estates in Ghana. Our forest is fast degrading, and there are a lot of problems. One, agriculture is accounting for 50% of the forest degradation. The mining is also another um, head of. So we have mining, agriculture, um, infrastructure, expansion, and development, and so on. So we need also to have technologies that should be able to address these problems. A technical advisor to the Forestry Commission, Dr. Kwachi Amiao, called the agreement the icing on the cake of what already exists between the Canadians and environment-oriented institutions in Ghana. In our case, almost everything is manual, but there are a lot of encroachments all over. But we believe that they have a technology that will make detection of offenses very easy. You know, once we are able to detect the offenses, we'll be able to deal with them as and when they are detected. Dr. Matthew Lynch, an associate professor of the Lakehead University of Canada, said the kennel of the deal is exchange programs. So we specialize in forest management and resource management. Um, everything from wood science and forest products, which is my area of expertise, to geomatics, remote sensing, soils, pathology, entomology, biometrics, um, management planning, forest operations, as well as wildlife management and other resources, water and what have you resources. Canada's embassy in Ghana described the agreement as a new page on Ghana and Canada relations of epic proportions. Napoleon Atukito reporting. Okay, so that's just a, and this is, you know, an example. We do this in a few places, but it's, it just shows you that, you know, we're not just stuck in Thunder Bay. We, we actually are a global 
faculty. And part of this is we, we bring this into our field schools, which I'll discuss in a few minutes, as well as our undergrads. This work in Ghana is going to allow exchange of undergrads and grad students between the two countries going both ways, as well as faculty um, to do this and research. So it's not only us doing work, but we bring our students into these too, which is again, very beneficial for students and they, they uh, very much enjoy being able to travel with us on these types of things. Oops. Okay, so goal of resource management, eco ecologically valuable, economically feasible, socially acceptable. We want that center that includes all of this and that's what we aim for in Canada, as you can see here, where we have very diverse forests from the Arctic right down to the Carolinian hardwood forest in Southern Ontario and a huge swath of boreal forest across Canada but also as the little spinning here shows around the world. And what we know here is applicable globally. Keep in mind, uh, hold on for a second. Yep. We say forestry, forestry, forestry. Keep in mind that if you have two degrees and some of you probably have, will possibly sign up for the other degree. They're very, very similar. Yep. And uh, so forestry to me is land stewardship. I've been a forester for many, many years, and and uh, just keep that in mind. So, if you're if you're thinking of applying for the other degree, when we say forestry or forest, we mean both degrees. Just keep that in mind. So there's no misunderstanding there. Um, just a quick comment about that Ghana thing. Uh, when I watched that news clip, it I felt a lot of pride because we've been involved in Ghana since the early 90s. And it's not dying, it's growing. And all our efforts in Ghana or China or India or Nepal, they have always, always involved undergraduate students. So it's not just that you hear about that the professors are doing research in some exciting place in the world. Students get involved. Okay, continue, Matt. Okay. Um, Okay, so as it says here, as all says, we're, we're basically land use managers. So the past was for sustenance, the present land use for calm use and increasingly other stuff, which is societal needs. So changing values, changing forests. So we are natural resources management and this, I'm not gonna read this cause you have it, but it basically states what we are. We're about stewardship for the outcome of reaching a balance of ecological sustainability, economic viability and societal acceptance. And that includes wildlife, water, scenic, First Nations, best practices in resource development and construction. So we cover all of that in our program. Okay, and we're very much on lifelong learning. So we get into the, 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 you know, the meat and potatoes here. What we offer is we have literally two um, main streams and I'll get into them in a sec, but when you start with us, the first two years are common. So all the students work together for two years and you get to know everybody that way. And our years tend to mingle as well. But two years common for forestry and the environmental management, which are our two programs, an honors bachelor of science in forestry and an honors bachelor of environmental management, which we are working to get to become an honors bachelor of science in environmental management. Okay, so you do two years together. And then in the beginning of your third year, you make a choice whether you want to be in the HBSCF or the EM. So you have two years to talk to your fellow classmates about what they're doing. Some students may start, I want to be an EM, but by the time they make the selection, they're not, I'm hundred percent forestry. I've had two summers worth of work and I love this. And some go the other way. I mean, it's up to you. Um, we can advise you, but it's up to you on um, what your interests are. So forestry, you start that in third year or environmental management. You start that in third year. Okay, and, and in within those, you have three specializations. So in the forestry, we have forest management, forest health and production, forest products and marketing, just as a stream. They're all under that accredited program umbrella. And if you graduate, you can all work at any job. It's just some are more focused on certain areas of it. Okay, but it doesn't mean if you're in forest products and marketing, you can't take a forest management job. You can. Um, you just have a few more, mainly your electives are in the specialization. Okay, so you cover things like pathology, wood science, remote sensing, forest management, urban forestry, forest products, marketing, so on and so forth. On the environmental management side, we have three options again, wildlife conservation and management, conservation planning and management, and sustainable land use. Okay, same sort of thing. 
you take a bunch of courses and you you can work in any of the areas but you are trained more so on environmental management side of things than forestry so the course selections are slightly different um, and the forestry currently is a fully accredited program rpf um, eligible the environmental management isn't and will be hopefully soon is what we're working on but it's the program still gets you good jobs it's just if you want to be an rpf um, we need that different accreditation on that program Okay, and this just briefly shows again forest management, health and protection, products and marketing, and then wildlife conservation is sustainable. This sort of main things that you do in each one, which your interests are, um, and the fact that there's some courses and electives that you take within each one. So in each program, you have four courses, and then you have electives that you can take to fill more particular interests. Okay, and the so most two, common do, stream on the EM is the fish and wildlife. The most yeah. common stream on the forest management side or the forestry side is probably forest management. Yeah. Um, yeah, and again, just as an example, if you want to be a conservation officer with uh, the Ontario Ministry uh, uh, of Natural Resources, you will pick the environmental management stream, fish and wildlife. Yeah. Yep. So these are the main things we do. And like I say, each one of them has lots of job opportunities. Any any job that's open to the forestry students, anyone can, any all three of these streams could take it. You're not restricted in that sense. So if you choose one, it doesn't mean you're out of, you know, the, the game for uh, jobs in another area. Um, everybody in this program can apply to all the same types of jobs. There's just some maybe more specific. So these like health and protection there, they do like urban forestry and stuff like that, pathology and entomology, a little more detailed. If a job comes up for an urban forester, probably he's going to come from them because of certain courses they take. It doesn't say a forest manager, forest management or forest products couldn't apply to that. Um, they qualified, but they may have a course or two in their elective stream that makes them a bit more um, appropriate, if you will. Okay, so, so those are our degrees and that's how we do it. Um, so there's lots of change, four year degree, um, well, two different four year degrees. Um, and again, initially you learn about, we learn about all sorts. We start you at the beginning and we work you through it. So some basic information, and then we go into how that all works, including canopy, soils, forest floors, all of that. Um, then you start looking at timber management with some constraints. So how we, how we actually do regeneration, stand tending, harvesting, where it goes, then what we can make out of it, modeling of all this. And that's the one thing, uh, all they're very good on computer modeling and showing stuff like this, as well as drones and other technologies. We, we like to keep on top of what's out there that we can use to train students better. So we can predict forest growth using modeling scenarios like these. Okay, and then you'll be looking at everything that does with the resources. So we're looking at um, forest ecology and silvics, soils, wood technology, um, entomology, pathology, uh, remote sensing photogrammetry. We still measure lots of stuff. That's part and parcel of what we do as foresters. What the influence of fire is, how it affects ecologies and you know redevelopment of, of sites if they've been burnt and what have you, how bugs affect it, how fungi. So how all these things integrate and work together and then how we deal with it for management. Okay, in the past, a lot was spent on silviculture and it defined us in the 70s, how we manage forests. It's still a focus, but now we include a lot of other stuff. It's not all 100% just about wood production. It's about everything in the forest and doing it sustainably. Okay, so we can do silviculture where we do nothing. We thin it and get to where we wanna be first. We selective log or we clear cut. We have lots of options, but now we have to include things like the wildlife, we include like the First Nations in the area, um, you know, water and all the other resources that are there to make sure that we're not just sustaining trees, but we're sustaining ecosystems. And that's important. Uh, if you look at certain countries with all plantations, the first thing they'll admit is that their biodiversity is lacking and they're trying to get it back. We still have very good biodiversity in this country and we manage our forest very well for that. And that's what we train people for. Okay, harvesting, road construction, mechanization, still a part of forestry, but it's not just cutting the trees it could be road building across lakes for northern roads. 
um, doing operations in the far north, which isn't your standard forestry. You know, using things like you know the economics of everything now, not just looking at it, looking very in detail about what the economics are, what the feasibilities are, what are the other options. We used to call leftovers in the industry waste. We don't really have waste anymore because we make something out of everything. Um, so we're very efficient at how we do business now, and that's comes from looking at everything with wide open eyes, not with real blinders on, um, in order to, to maintain the view that we are seeing from, from the public, we have to make sure now that we're very open about how we do things and very open about how we're very sustainable. Um, like I say, for a long time, we did our business behind closed doors. Uh, environmental groups and that are more demanding on how we're doing our business. So we have to, you know, sort of explain that we are very sustainable and we are not doing damage. So this includes um, both in-class labs during the school year, but we also have a thing, a two-week field school every fall. And that is taking our students out and showing them both, whether it be regional, local, national, or international. And we include fish and wildlife, computing, biometrics, biology, chemistry, climatology, forest history, legislation, genetics, uh, you know, everything that you can imagine. When we take trips with students, we want them to see it all. We don't want them just to see the mills. Don't want them just to go out and see a moose. We want them to see everything that's included that both those things can still sustain on the landscape, including government policies, you know, environmentalists, what their concerns, everything we include in our field schools in order so that, because we bring both forestry and environmental students on the same field schools. So we incorporate both areas into the field school. So everybody, and we do that intentionally so that our foresters get to see what the EM students are doing and the EM students get to see what the foresters are doing. Because at the end of the day, they're probably going to work together when they graduate and we don't want them doing this. We want them working together. Okay, so we train our students to, un to recognize what happens on both degrees, which is working very well. Okay, so again, two undergraduate degrees, six specializations, PhD, master's, bachelor's, and HBM that we have. And there's a lot here. So we also, on top of all of this, um, with our accreditations, to adopt this much and still keep students staying the accrediting place can be an easy task. We do a lot with our students to try and keep them sane. Field school is fun, it's intensive, but we always have days where we just go out and do neat things. Same during the year, we have the undergrads have a, a student society. They put together lots of, they have ice, you know, hockey games. They'll have a lumberjack night or we have a timber sports team that I'm the head coach of. So we compete in logger sports. Um, they put together all sorts of events with the students. And they, we have a small group, so they have a lot of fun when they do things. They have big corn boils or they'll have go out ice fishing for a day or you know, they'll have different pub events where they raise money and stuff. So they're a very active group and they like to make sure all the students keep having fun. And again, one, one year one through four, they all mingle. We're not big enough to separate, so they mingle. So the students can talk to the senior students, find out what they're doing, what they like, where their summer jobs were. It's a very much sort of like a big family um, scenario. Hold that slide for a second, Matt. On yep. the right hand, you go back one slide. On the right hand side, you see a blue box. Yep. Oh yeah. That That's blue box part. is crucially important and we're very proud of that. Yep. We've, since I've started in 2003, at graduation, we've had 100% employment of our students. That's something to be proud of. Not, any fa not every faculty can state that. Very few can state that actually. Um, they all have good jobs and if they want to work, there's a job for you. It doesn't have to be right here. It can be anywhere across Canada. It can be international. We have students working overseas. Um, so there's no limits really, but a good point is our students, a lot of them make enough in the summer to pay for their tuition, pay for their school year. So they come out debt free and then they all have jobs when they graduate. And a lot of those jobs are ones that they work during this, during their summers. And then they want to employ them when they're finished. So it, it's, there's a lot of people and we have graduates, alumni all over the place. So wherever you get a job, you can be sure you're probably gonna find a Lakehead alumni there and you're gonna have a friend that's gonna help you get settled. Okay, and then like I say, I've mentioned before, design our preoccupation with silviculture into other stuff. And that's stuff like, uh, you know, like Ulf's work in the drone work, you know, we are, What's the official title? Well, you're an official trainer for Transport Canada for drones, right? Yeah, we're an official training center for 
for getting the pilot license. And we have our own airfield. Uh, we have 20 drones of all kinds of shapes. And uh, the last couple of years, we also fly in lakes. So we go below the water and look at fish and look at uh, pollution and whatnot. So the flying is uh, above ground and below the water. So that's, I mean, that's somewhere we've moved to. We've become a real center for drone and remote sensing through Alts Group. My group, we do wood science uh, research that we're, some of the, the mapping work we do, we're the only ones on the planet who have figured out how to do it. So we, we do have some state-of-the-art researchers and research going on here. And again, the nice thing about that for students is we involve them in everything. We bring our work into our labs. We bring students on for summer, for thesis, stuff like that. So you get, you don't just get to look from the outside, you get to fly drones and you get to do stuff like this. Okay, and again, not just about spruce, it's about everything. Um, with field school, and I'm gonna get into that, I won't mention a lot here, but you know, we take students in groups to, uh, we've been like South Africa, oil sands in, Ontario, in uh, Alberta, throughout Ontario, New Brunswick. So across Canada, we've taken students and to a multitude of countries around the world, which I'll explain. Um, you know, the Wildlife Society AGM, the students who are in that wildlife take that. And when they graduate from us in their wildlife, what's the classification off again? They are- uh, They're certified wildlife biologists, which is a yeah. North American designation. Yeah, so when you graduate with that stream, you have that certification as well, which is just an added bonus. That very handsome individual together with that baby elephant happens to be me in Nepal. <laughs> I've got a similar like that one in, uh, in India when I was there with Shander, yeah. <laughs> hanging with an elephant. Okay, so field school is one of the things that we're really proud of. We've taken this to the next level, I think. Um, we have local regional, national, and international field school. In the first couple of years, first year is usually local, regional. Um, second year, we start moving them a bit further away from town. Uh, third year, they could be anywhere within Canada um, or international, and fourth year, same thing. We have, a re we have a national and international. Students for the international apply to the dean, and we take a certain number in third year and fourth year to international destinations. And again, when we do that, the, oops, the idea is that we, we not just show them, we show them what their industry is, but we show them about their wildlife, we show them about their environmental concerns, we show them about policy, government, ministries. We cover as much as we possibly can in the couple of weeks that we're there with a day or two off so we can, you know, go out and goof around and, and look at the, look at what they're, what, you know, what the, what the country is. So with the students, we've never heard a bad thing from students on these trips. They just and keep in mind, the idea is not to show anyone that it's better anywhere else. It's different everywhere else. Right. And one thing for me, being born and raised in a different country, um, every time I go out, I become more and more proud to be living in where we are. Um, I'm Swedish. And when it comes to forestry, uh, and forest management, we do a better job here than they do in Sweden, even though Sweden gets a lot of credit for somehow doing it right. But biodiversity, we beat them hands down. So I sent Matt to Sweden to check it out with a ton of students and they came back feeling, wow, it's not so bad in Ontario after all. And that's the purpose of these things, not to show you that you should go work around the world, but to show you something different. Yep. And to, help, and to help try and show people that we do a pretty good job here in Canada. Yeah. So this just shows a few things. So regional, here we've got, we took the students to New Brunswick one year. We've been all over Ontario, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, New Brunswick. Here's over in Atacokan. We took them there to power plants, pellet plants, sawmills. Thunder Bay out in the bush here, we have a lot of it. So we can take them out on tours for a variety of things with ministries, industries, what have you. So we do that and they get to see everything from the forest, to industry, to how we do stuff in the bush, to ecological and wildlife and so on. Um, international, this, this is a real highlight for a lot of students. Um, here we've got Brian, one of our wildlife professors in Ecuador. This is one of the students we had in Sweden. This was a, a thousand year old copper mine, the oldest mine on the planet. And we took the students down in there. This was in Ecuador too, close to the Amazon with some students. This I believe was in Ghana. There's my, one of my grad students playing with a monkey. 
and out with the elephants there with a, um, a warden. This was in Sweden here, looking at their very intensive forestry that they do here. Um, this was in Ghana again, beautiful uh, tropical forests. Um, same here. And then this was the group of us in Sweden again. Uh, so we, again, we look at everything. You can, in this one picture, you can see mining, waters, uh, wildlife, intensive forestry, natural forestry reserves, industrial um, logging. So, and again, so we try and hit these on all the trips. And, you know, you, you don't see any pictures where students aren't smiling. They absolutely love these trips and it's well worth it. And they pay a certain amount towards field school, but then the faculty covers the rest. We have some endowments that has allowed us to take students on these big trips. Um, so it's not crazy expensive for them. It's a thousand dollars for an internet, an extra thousand dollars for an international field school. And then we top up whatever else is required on top of that. So, and so, I mean, one, you make your friends even closer that you had, and two, you start meeting people internationally. I know a couple of our students have gone back to Sweden um, based on this for a final year, uh, half a year semester there, which we have exchange programs we can set up. Um, one of our students is working down in Vietnam teaching and stuff like that too. And he was on the, the African trip, South Africa trip that I took students on there. So this is part of that. We took students to the uh, um, World Forestry Congress in Durban, South Africa. Another professor and I, we took them there. So we were out in the for forest doing forestry type field work, but then we have days off. So this is one day we went on a safari. Another day, none of the kids had ever been surfing. So we got a guy and we went surfing in the Indian Ocean, um, just as a day off type thing, something fun to do. And then we get, we do forestry. And like this one was a conference, which was phenomenal, 3,500 people. But just for an idea, I mean, I lived in Australia for 10 years and this is a big thing in the Southern hemisphere is eucalyptus. This is Zach, one of our students. This is a nine month old eucalyptus tree. This great big one here is a five year old eucalyptus tree. Okay, this is that competition I was talking about from the Southern hemisphere. You can literally watch trees grow there. And I actually have done that. Okay, so, so that's field school. I mean, it, and it, we've covered, we've gone to places like, um, I don't know if I listed them there, but South Africa, uh, China, India, uh, Czech Republic, Estonia, Finland, Sweden, um, Ecuador, into the States. Croatia, um, Czech Republic. Croatia. Oh, I mentioned Czech, not the Croatia, yeah. yeah. But a multitude of places, and we continue to do this. Um, it's part and parcel of what we do. So, I mean, it, it adds a level to ours, and it gives students some international experience and how other people do business, which is always good. So to, to make sure we stay on top of what's happening, we've added things like conflict resolution, GIS, decision support. All of these points are new things we put into the program over time to make sure we're keeping up to date with what's happening. Okay. And then we have these. The one thing is at the end of the four years, you have a thesis in your fourth year. You do a research project with a supervisor on something that you're very interested in. Okay. And that's a full year project where you write a final year thesis. And that's you know one of these capstone things, you walk away with a almost like a small book that you wrote um, with a supervisor. And so that's also exciting for students because it's they can focus on something particular, okay? So we're just about done there. So career opportunities, this is like a fraction of the list. There is an endless number of career opportunities, both in inside uh, communities, but also in rural, rural environments, overseas. Um, literally, there's very there's a multitude of areas you can work in with these degrees. Um, it may seem like you're limited, but you're actually not. There's all sorts of areas that the training as a manager and, and the knowledge you have can be put across a few disciplines. So there's lots of opportunities. And then of course, your future, we will grow and will change. Status quo is not an option for us. We keep moving. Um, and keeping tight with the people that we work for, which is both the government, the industry, and society. And then I'll give you an example of a thesis student. Uh, she was an EM student, and she did her fourth year thesis on fish farming in Norway. She did one semester in her third year in Norway and got credit for that. And now she's an environmental assessor for a gold mining company. 
so it just shows you, you know, open-minded. And anyway, here Matt is showing you how you get hold of us. Yeah, we got all sorts of stay connected at, uh, you know, Twitter and Facebook and all of that, um, contacting our faculty directly. And then all email and office number is there, my email and office number. If you're going to contact, it's probably best on email right now because we're not in our offices that often. And then Lenny Meyer, who isn't with us today, but he's the chair of the Environmental Management Program. So I guess now, Alex, we can open it up if anyone has any questions. Uh, yeah, they're, they've been a quiet group thus far. I've been uh, just sitting back enjoying the, the PowerPoint, uh, but we do have 10 minutes left, everyone. So if you have any questions, please do, uh, please do ask them. And there's no such thing as a bad question. So fire away. Keep in mind that if you choose to come our way, um, there are many, many opportunities to come and talk about not just your courses, but things in general. And uh, we're very open-minded and our job is to help. And uh, we've been in your situation in the past. Uh, students have come to our program and after four years, I realized, oh, yeah, I'm glad I got four years, but I want to do something slightly a little different. Well, it is a science-based program. So you haven't shot yourself in the foot. You can go anywhere with this. And uh, so uh, how many people, Alex, do we have online right now? Uh, we had six and now we're down to five. So okay. Okay. Um, I actually have a question. Is it true? I've heard that not a lot of people opt for the co-op route because they get such good summer jobs that they don't need to extend their degree by doing a co-op? That is absolutely true. And uh, so we don't really push the co-op program that much. Now, typically students that choose the co-op program come from high school with a slightly higher average. Uh, but many of those uh, realize quite quickly that uh, particularly these days when it's so easy to find work that uh, they should drop it. Uh, if you truly want to spend an extra year uh, in education, co-op is great, but that extra year could be a course-based master's degree, which takes 16 months now. Uh, so anyway, we, we welcome students in the co-op, but again, we're not pushing it that hard and more students will drop it after this start. And Alex, I'm the co-op um, advisor for NRM. And so uh, quite, as I've said, quite a few do start it. Um, a couple stick with it. We've had a few students who had specific summer jobs that they wanted to go more than the four months. And the co-op yep. allows work terms four, six, eight, or 12 months. We had one student, his first term was like six months, his second one was eight, and his last term was a full year. And that was with uh, Ontario Hydro in their, in their forestry uh, uh, division. Yep. And so he worked, it, it worked well for him because they wanted him for longer periods of time as they sort of trained him and built him up to uh, take on a role when he graduated. But a lot of the students will start it and then they actually drop it because there is a cost with co-op and most all of our students get summer employment very quickly. So co-op is usually there if, if employment's not as free and easy to get, but our students never seem to have an issue finding summer jobs. And so it, unless they specifically are working for someone and they know they want to have longer work terms, um, rather than deferring their schooling, they can do the co-op and then that allows them to have that longer work term. Great, thanks a lot. And just so the four that are remaining know, the university has announced a return to in-person classes starting in September. So bearing any, any unforeseen circumstances, we hope that we'll have this, this pandemic behind us by that point and that it'll be a return to uh, in-person classes. And on that note, we have two minutes left um, I want to take this opportunity to thank uh, Matt and Ulf for a very informative presentation. Um, you have their emails. There's my clock that I warned you about. Um, you have their email addresses. Um, you have ours for the recruitment office. Um, if you didn't get a chance to get Matt or Ulf's email, don't worry. Just email me at recruit. It's there in the chat box and I can forward your emails to them. Um, any last words? Say, well, normally I would say this, if in a non-COVID environment, if someone happens to be in Thunder Bay and want a tour, we do those, um, whether it's a Monday or a Sunday or whatnot. So, 
uh, that will eventually happen again when COVID settles down. Matt? So I'm saying any questions you have, feel free to email all tonight. Um, you know, don't feel like, you know, it's a waste of our time. Nothing's a waste of time when it comes to questions from our students. So by all means, anything you want to know, email us or if you want to have a chat you can email us and we'll give you a number that you can call direct or we can set up a zoom or what have you did we answer most of your questions emma hannah catherine and simon i'm going to make you type <laughs> did you learn anything that you didn't know about the program or any clarity you're welcome emma yep, my pleasure if you want a guaranteed job, this is the faculty for you. I know the my colleagues have said it, but it's it's, it's very true. 50-50 male female, by the way. Yeah. It's very different than when I did my undergrad. I think there was one girl in the entire class. <laughs> it's a bit different now. I mean the, the program it's a great program. When we go to the OUF each year down in Toronto, which this year was virtual, but when we're in person, I mean, when Alf and I are there and if we're talking to the students and their parents, it's not uncommon for the parents to say to us, good Lord, we want to come back to school. And then, the, then they're quite happy for their students to come to us once they've met us. But. Perfect. Okay, so thanks, uh, Emma. Thanks, Hannah. Thanks, Catherine. Thanks, Simon. I, again, get ready to shout your name from the rooftops when you get to Lakehead because um, you're, you're not going to be hidden away, you know, herded into huge lecture halls like cattle. You're very much a person with a name. Thanks, uh, Ulf and Matt, and we'll see you again soon. Hey, thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Bye, everybody.